in my mother's womb. You formed me with your hands, known and loved by you. Before I took a breath, and when I doubted, Lord, remind me, I'm wonderfully made. You're an artist and a potter, I'm the canvas and the clay. All things work together for my future and for my good. And you make all things work together for your glory and for your name. There's a healing light just beyond the clouds. No, I've walked through fire. Oh, I see clearly now. And I know nothing has been wasted. No failure or mistake. You're an artist and a potter. I'm the canvas and the clay. And you make all things. first day of the week. While it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. 
Then Simon Peter came along behind him, and he went straight into the tomb, and he saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside, and he saw and believed. One week ago, we celebrated the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. This is an event that happened 2,000 years in our past. We live in an Easter world, and yet we come together to remember what Christ did on our behalf on Good Friday as he went to the cross, as he died for us, as he paid the price for our sins, as he took the cross that we deserved. This cross stands in our church today, not as a, an idol that we worship, but as a reminder of what Christ did on our behalf. Then on Easter Sunday, he rose from the dead. He burst forth from the tomb. He defeated death, giving us hope of eternal life. And so today, with with great joy and with great acclamation, we declare that he is risen. He is risen. And we celebrate today that our God is risen. What a great time it is to be alive because we know we don't walk through life without hope. We know we don't walk through this world of troubles and struggles. I mean, sin still exists, right? We see it all around us each and every day of our lives. We are confronted by the presence of sin in the world. We see terrible things happening. We do things in our own lives that we are ashamed of things that we need to repent of, things that we need to bring before God, to lay before Him because we recognize we've turned our backs and we've said, God, I'm going my own way. And thank God that He is patient and He waits for us and He reaches out to us and He continues to call us and draw us back together. We are starting a new series today. And this is going to build off of Easter because we are in the season of Easter right now, leading up until the Ascension and Pentecost. Uh, We have this period of time that's Easter season. Jesus is spending his time just kind of running around. Spends 40 days walking the earth, appearing to people, teaching the resurrected Christ in a completely different way than he had done for the three years previously. And yet it's still the same. It's still relational. It's still interactive. And yet Jesus proves who he is, and what he's done. And so we're going to be talking about those over the next few weeks. Uh, I have a little bit of a bonus this week. Uh, You get, uh, those of you who showed up today are are fortunate to get Orly preaching today, so you can celebrate that. Go ahead. Yeah, Orly stepped in so I could take a little bit of vacation this week, and so uh, so we're we're excited to hear as he he talks about uh, uh, talks about doubting Thomas and the doubts that affect our lives as he comes to kick off this Jesus is alive series this morning. Uh, but we're going to look at what Jesus does during that time because Jesus never does anything by accident; it's always on purpose. It's always intentional. It always speaks to what he has done for us and what he wants to do through us in our lives. Will you join me this morning as we open with prayer? Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we come in this place. We lay our lives before you. We open up our hearts to you. We pray, Lord, that you would fill us with your presence. May we live in the world of the resurrection, Lord. May we embrace Easter as we celebrate not just the forgiveness of our sins, Lord. We trust in you. That when we bring in complete repentance, we bring our sins before you, Lord. We lay those down that you forgive us for those sins. But we also pray, Lord, that we would embrace the resurrection. That we would recognize that we aren't just forgiven for our sins, but we are also made part of your family. That this life we live on this earth is, is just a temporary time. But the greater life that we will live will be with you. So, Lord, fill us with your presence this morning. May we worship and celebrate. Jesus is alive. And we live in that glorious knowledge. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And as I will invite you to stand this morning, I do have one announcement as we get started. Uh, Out on the welcome table this morning, uh, if you are able to help us out, I've got a sign-up sheet out there. We haven't had a sign-up sheet in months. This is very exciting for me. I love sign-up sheets. Uh, But we are now into the spring season. We would love to have flowers each week for the altar. I want to thank Cindy for bringing uh, our arrangement today. But if you you can help us out by bringing flowers on a Sunday, we'd love to have you sign up. There's a whole bunch of dates on there. Uh, That would be great if you can help us out. And with that, I would invite you to stand as we celebrate this morning our Lord and risen King. If 
faith can move the mountains let the mountains move we come with expectation waiting here for you waiting here for you you're the lord of all creation and still you know my heart the author of salvation you've loved us from the start Waiting here for you With our hands lifted high In praise And it's you We adore Singing high
your sin runs deep your grace is more where grace is found is where you are and where you are lord i am free few minutes. This is part of our worship service. This is an incredibly important part. You know, growing up, I don't think I truly understood. Uh, prayer was those times when you, you know, closed your eyes and you hoped that the pastor would get done um, so that you could get on to the fun stuff again of church, which for me growing up in a Lutheran church was communion came next, and that was really exciting when you uh, have had your first communion and you realize that you get to take communion with all the big people. But prayer is such an important part of what we do because this is our conversation with God. This is the time that we spend uh, in, in, in church on Sunday morning, uh, in our own lives, uh, communicating with God. See, the thing about God is he knows everything that's going on in our lives. He knows how you're feeling right now. He knows whether you're happy. He knows whether you're angry. He knows whether you're struggling with something. He knows all of it. And yet he still invites us to pray, not because he needs to hear it, but because he needs us to say it. When we pray, we take that time to examine our hearts. We take time to expose, to unearth things that maybe we don't want to dredge up. Maybe we don't want to focus on. Maybe we don't want to face. But it's also a step of faith. In our resurrected God, we, we come and we lay before him our troubles and our problems. We place them into his care and we trust that he will take care of them. And the answers don't always look the way that we expect and that's a struggle at times. But as we sang in the first song in Canvas and Clay, I love the, wor the words that say, uh, and this is the Eli's International paraphrase again because I can't remember them all of a sudden, but uh, he's working everything in my life for my future and for my good. That means even the things that are painful, the things that we struggle with, God can still do something good out of them. He doesn't cause them, he doesn't create them, but he does something incredible in the midst of them. And so you join me this morning as we lift up prayers for our community, for family members, people who join us in worship who are struggling in our own lives, lives of our family and our friends. So we pray for our nation, we pray for our leaders, and we pray for all of our leaders. Whether we agree with them or not, we still pray for them. And so we come this morning to lift up our prayers before God.
Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we come this morning lifting up our prayers to you. We come this morning, Lord, with joy in our hearts as we thank you, Lord, for the resurrection. We thank you for the work that you did on the cross on our behalf, taking the punishment that we owed for our sins, doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. Lord, you took a debt that you didn't owe and you paid the price. You went to that cross and you gave your life on our behalf. And so, Lord, we walk in a place where we know that true repentance brings forgiveness. And we are grateful, Lord, for that forgiveness. As you forgive us for our sins, as you draw us back when we walk away, as you, as you turn us back around to face you, Lord. We pray that you would continue to fill us with your presence. The Holy Spirit would be alive and at work in us and through us. We come also, Lord, giving thanks for the resurrection. Lord, that you not only have forgiven us for our sins, but you have, you have brought us into your family, that you have made us part, you have given us home. That you say you are welcome here. And so, Lord, as we go through our life, we recognize that this life is not one that's lived in vain. It's not one that we desperately cling to. But instead, Lord, we live here doing the work that you've called us to do, and we live in joyful anticipation, Lord, of eternal life with you. And so we pray, Lord, that you would fill us with the joy that that, that, that promise of the resurrection, that that, that that work that you did on the cross, that that, that explosion out of the tomb, Lord, all of that brings with it. Fill us, Lord, with the joy of living in an Easter world. Lord, we also come this morning recognizing that sin is still a part of our world, that there continue to be struggles and challenges. We see hurt and we see pain. We see anger and strife. We see broken relationships. We see destroyed families. We see countries that exist in, th in, in ongoing threats of war. We live in a world where disease has swept around our globe and has had an incredible impact on the lives of so many. As family members have lost loved ones, as many have dealt with long stints in the hospital or long, long periods of battle with this illness. We give thanks, Lord, for those who have been touched lightly or not at all. We thank you that, that, that you watch over each and every circumstance. And so, Lord, we pray today for the world in which we live. Your word has promised us that one day this world will be at peace, but that's not right now. And so we pray, Lord, that in the midst of the trouble, your presence is at work. And that we can see it, and we can celebrate it, and we can, we can cling to it. And then it will give us strength for the journey that we are in the midst of. Lord, we pray for our nation. And we pray for our leaders who recognize, Lord, that the authority that is exercised on this world comes from you. And so we pray, Lord, for, uh, for our leaders that you would grant them wisdom, that you would give them the ability to govern well. Lord, we pray for our teachers and our children, for all the staff that work in our schools as they continue to navigate, as we've prayed over and over for the last year, as they continue to navigate new normals. Lord, as schools reopen, it brings a whole host of new challenges. And we pray, Lord, for all of the staff and all of the teachers and all the children who have to navigate this. So we are excited that more and more kids get to go back to school, but we also recognize the challenges that brings and the burden that places upon all of those who function in our schools. And so we pray for strength. We pray for courage. We pray for dedication. And we give thanks, Lord, for the calling that causes these, uh, these people to continue to come back day after day to serve the children that they teach and they lead and they guide as they grow. Lord, we pray for healing for all of those who struggle with disease and illness. We pray for Judy Trier's daughter, Valerie. We give thanks that she is doing better but we also pray for her recovery, Lord. We pray that your healing hand would be upon her. We pray for Elena as she battles with migraines, Lord. We pray that you would bring healing and restoration to her. We pray for Fawn's daughter, Brianna. We pray for Linda Lelak. 
for Julie Thorns, for Nancy Kajensru. We pray for Avery Smith. We pray for continued healing for Vicki Cron's daughter-in-law. We pray for Vicki Epperson and Margie Goldsby. For relief of pain for Fawn Glover. Lord, we pray for those battling cancer. JT and Betty's friend, Lindsay Garcia. For Brenda Brown. Lord, we pray for peace and comfort for her. We pray for healing and we pray for peace for, uh, for Eric and Jennifer and their family. We pray for Ellen Roloff as she battles lung cancer. Pray for Rob Martian's mother, Roberta. John Griffin, John Lamison, Vanessa Becker, Dean Grossback, Dave Pank, Verlin Larson, Debbie Fole. And Lord, we pray for those who grieve. We pray for peace and comfort for the families left behind when loved ones transfer home. Pray for the family of Chris who died following a heart transplant. Pray for the families of Jacob Tangent and Logan Chiano. And Lord, for all of those other people, for all those circumstances in our lives, where we hurt, or we have pain, where we struggle, Lord, we pray for your peace and your comfort. We pray for your healing, Lord. You are a God of miracles, but the greatest miracle that you have given us, Lord, is your death on the cross for our forgiveness of sins and your resurrection from the dead for our eternal healing when we come home to you. Lord, fill us with your peace. We give thanks in all things, Lord. In the name of the one who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. This time I announce the offering. The offerings that we take go to support the ministries of Christ community. If you're a guest with us today, we are glad you're worshiping with us. Thank you for being here. Uh, as, you, as you know, at this time, our offering can be done in one of four ways. The red offering boxes by the entrance or out at the welcome table uh, through our post office box, uh, PO Box 1446 right here in Richfield, online at ccridgefield.com or in the church app, which I would remind you, if you have the church app on your phone, uh, you pull that out. Uh, the scripture verse from our uh, from the message today when Orly speaks is going to be in there. If you don't have it, go to the App Store, go to the Google Play Store on your Kindle and you can look for C.C. Ridgefield Church. I know that's weird, um, but you'd be amazed how many Christ communities are out there. So C.C. Ridgefield Church, you can find that. There's a whole host of information. We put all kinds of stuff in there. And with that, I would invite you to just take the next few minutes, reflect on how God has blessed you in your life. Now he's calling you to give back out of the rich blessings that he has granted to you. So our worship team leads us this morning. sadness from wherever you've been come broken hearted let a rescue begin come find your mercy sinner come kneel earth has no sorrow that heaven can heal earth has no sorrow that heaven can heal so lay down your burden up your face, oh wanderer, come home, you're not too far, so lay down your hurts, lay down your heart, come as you are, there's for the hopeless and all those who stray come sit at the table come taste the grace there's a rest for the weary a rest that endures earth has no sorrow that heaven can cure so lay down your burdens lay down your
There is joy for the morning. Sinner, be still. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can heal. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can heal. So lay down your are nice and bright. <laughs> Question for you this morning as we begin. How many of you believe that in my hand I have something that I'm going to show to you, and after I show it to you, you will never see it again? How many believe that? <laughs> There's a few of them believe that. Why do you believe it? What's that? Because you're telling us. Telling us, okay. Now, some of you didn't put your hand up. Why do you doubt me? What's that? Because you can't see it. Because you can't see it, okay. I can't see your hands either. <laughs> I'll show you. It's a cashew nut. You'll never see it again. <laughs> Today we want to talk about what we call and label Doubting Thomas. Aren't you glad your name isn't Thomas? <laughs> <laughs> but it's become a term that's come down through the ages. Doubting Thomas. He had a doubt. We want to talk today about doubts. A doubt is something that we have that we're uncertain about, we're undecided about, and an interesting side effect from doubt is fear. There's a lot of fear in the U.S. right now. In fact, Gallup took a poll and said that the mental health of the United States is the lowest it's been in 30 years. Now, the only exception to that, he found out, are those who worship regularly. Do you at all doubt God? Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Father, we've gathered here together we thank you for this opportunity. I pray that I might share your word, what you would desire for us to hear this morning. And I pray that all of us can have an open heart to hear what you have to say. That as we deal with our own doubts, We hear how you assist us and help us. We just ask your blessing upon this time. In Jesus' name, amen. The text is from John. It'll be read in two parts because it happens at two different times. The first part of this text actually takes place on Easter Sunday evening. Let me read it for us. 
That Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. As he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and his side. They were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. Again he said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. I want you to pretend for a moment that you're one of the 12 disciples. You've just spent three years, approximately, given of your life, you left your home, your jobs, your hobbies, and you became homeless for three years, not knowing from time to time where you were going to sleep at night, But you did it because Jesus came and he said, I want you to follow me. I want you to give up all of that for a while and follow me. Now, he still wanted them to have contacts with their families and so forth. But they weren't physically present. So that means that you were there, you saw him do miracles. You sat with him around the fire at night. Telling some jokes. Sometimes we think this is all just serious. But if you read some of the things that Jesus said and did it sometimes, he had to have a smile on his face. Like when he talked about a log in somebody's eye. It's a pretty ridiculous type of thing, but he made his point. And then you were there when the crowd came, and, or a small crowd, took him, killed him, crucified him on the cross. You were there. Then you heard he rose from the dead. Well, don't see too many people doing that. And so the text says, on this Sunday evening, on the evening of that day, they're gathered in a room behind a locked door. So it's not just Thomas that's doubting. All of them have some doubts. They were looking at the circumstances, and they had lost sight of just putting faith and trust in Jesus. If you were in that room, you'd smell the scent of candles, probably the dirt floor. You would sense the tension amongst them and the fears that were there. It says in our text, they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. The Jewish leaders had come and taken Jesus and crucified him. And they were his followers. So are they next? So they're there in fear. And suddenly, Jesus appears. I wonder what would happen this morning if suddenly Jesus is standing here next to me. I don't even know what he looks like, but he would stand here next to me. I don't know what I would say except take over. (laughs) So they were dealing with their own fears. Jesus said to them, peace be with you. And that peace isn't avoidance of war or conflict. That's not what this peace is talking about. This peace that he's talking about is a peace that's in our heart. It's an assurance. It's a security. It's just a comfortable thing. And as we know this peace, and we know at times when we go through turmoil and anxiety and maybe even once in a while worry, and we long for that peace that only God can give to us. He says it's a peace beyond our own understanding. And Jesus says, Peace be with you. I wonder what some of the reactions were. Yeah, 
Yeah, right. Or, that's so nice. Yeah, I don't think that was quite the response as we learn what happens through the week. But Jesus came there. Thomas wasn't there. So now let's read what happens a week later. One of the disciples, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. They told him, we have seen the Lord. But he replied, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands, put my fingers into them, and place my hand into the wound in his side. Eight days later, the disciples were together again, and this time Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you, he said. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer, but believe. My God and my Lord, Thomas exclaimed. Then Jesus told him, you believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. So all week long, the disciples, when they get together, are telling Thomas about, you should have been there, you should have seen this, this was fantastic. It's a week later, where do we find them? In a room behind locked doors. So even though they saw him, there's still doubts about what's going on. They haven't still put their complete and full trust in him that, okay, this is what's happening. We'll go about what you want us to do. They still had some of those doubts. So the question we need to address ourselves this morning a little bit, are you doubting God? Have you doubted God? I'm not asking for a particular response because I know the answer. Every one of us at times doubts God. I'm not talking about doubting whether God exists. I'm talking about as we experience circumstances in our life. I've been around quite a few people that are dealing with their last days in life. And having to deal with cancer or some other ailment that is terminal and it takes years, two, three, four, five years before they die from this particular illness. And I think almost everyone at some time says, does God really know what's going on in my life? I recently was visiting a guy whose wife had died and now he was still there by himself totally immobile, have it as a result of a stroke. And almost every time I would visit him, he would say, does God really know what's going on in my life? I know I believe him, but does he really know? Where is he at? Why does God seem distant? I can remember a number of times in my life. There was times when I know God called me to be a pastor, And there was times as I was studying to be a pastor, and as I first became a pastor, wondering, does God really know what he's doing calling me to be a pastor? Does he really know what I have to face in this situation? That really came true to me the first sermon I preached, and I flunked it. And I was, does God know what he's doing? Apparently he did. I'm still preaching. So we all go through that. And we need to admit it. I firmly think that for us to have faith means we also have doubts. Because our faith is in something that we have not seen. At least I have never seen Jesus face to face. And any time we are doing and dealing with something but you don't have the full evidence there, the scientific evidence... We have to base it on our faith and base it on our trust. There's going to be some times that there's a doubt. And 
I don't look at doubt as a bad thing. But we can look at doubt as an opportunity. An opportunity for God to come and speak to us in a special way. Now they're in the upper room. Thomas hasn't believed him all week. Suddenly, Jesus appears again. And he deals with Thomas's doubt. He said, Thomas, touch me and see. Touch my hands. Touch the side and, and see. There's a fantastic sidelight to this. When Jesus rose from the dead, he rose in a physical body. Or he wouldn't have had Thomas touch me and see. I don't know whether Thomas did or not. It doesn't make any difference. But Jesus invited him to do that. In our doubts, and we can have doubts as we deal with illness, doubts as we deal with a broken relationship, doubts as we deal with vocation and calling and jobs, Certainly now with what's going on with this COVID, it's producing all kinds of doubts. I hear it in conversations with people that I have. We live in a world that is imperfect. We live in a world in which there are all kinds of circumstances which are beyond our control and which if we could really say, you know, if we all could say, I don't want to have this COVID thing, I want it to go away, We'd all say that. I don't think there's a single person that would doubt, would go against that. But it's not going to happen. So we call Doubting Thomas. This text is really more about Jesus and what Jesus does with our doubts. The first thing he does is he he steps into the circumstance. They're behind locked doors. He's not waiting for the disciples to get out behind locked doors and happen to see Jesus sitting on a bench someplace along the side of the street. He goes where they are at. He enters that circumstance behind locked doors. He goes there where they're living in fear, He goes where they're living in doubts. Jesus takes the initiative. And that's in our life also when we deal with our doubts. He doesn't come to us and say, well, I told you better. If you're going to doubt me, I'm just going to go to somebody else that's not going to doubt me. He doesn't chalk it up and say, oh, there's one more thing against you. He comes to whatever their circumstance is at. His promise in Matthew is, Lo, I'm with you always. I'm always with you. And see, when we doubt God, we have these doubts in God, some of that is we wonder if God knows what's happening in our life. Is he present in our life? Is he someplace out there taking care of bigger things? And I'm just little old me? Jesus says, I'm coming. He doesn't come to chastise. He doesn't come to whatever you want to say and tell us off or whatever. He just comes there to be present. The second thing he does is he offers words of comfort. He came to them and said, peace be with you. He didn't come to them and say, you dirty, rotten scoundrels, why are you doubting me? I gave you three years of my life. I taught you all the seminary classes. I did all this kind of stuff. I taught you all the theology. I did all this kind of stuff. And now you're treating me like this? Never once. And he's not going to do that to us either. His words are going to be, peace be with you. That's through the power of the Holy Spirit in our life. Those words may come from a pastor that's visiting you. May come from A friend may come from reading the scriptures. It may come from watching something on TV that's a spiritual program. Who knows where it comes from, but 
Christ enters our circumstances. Christ enters where we are at and we are doubting. He does it and he gives us these words of comfort. Thirdly, he touches us. He invited Thomas here. Touch me. Touch me. You and I will probably in our life here on earth never touch Christ physically. I'm about 99.9% sure. Not that he couldn't do that. He just doesn't operate that way. But he touches us. Most of that comes through other people. And I'm not saying necessarily a physical touch, but I'm saying a spiritual type of touch just through our presence. I could go back through my life and I could give you all kinds of examples of people who touched us. I had an experience this last week. I'll save that for a little bit. I want to go to the next point. The next point is, he sends us out. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. So it doesn't stop there. We get to go out and be the presence of Christ in the lives of others. Whether it's in our homes, our families, in our communities, our neighborhood. We just need to be ready. Give an example of this last week in my own life. We're getting ready to move we had somebody come and take some of our furniture. Never met him before. And in the course of the conversation, before they left, her mom had passed away a few months ago. And we spent about 20 minutes talking about that and what Christ can do to help that. Any of you can do that. We just need to be available. We need to believe that when you go out there, or if you go out that door, listen to the words of Jesus when he says, as the Father has sent me, so I'm sending you. And we get to be his presence in the world. We get to, we get to be his touch in the lives of others as he's touched us. Those final words that he spoke to Thomas he says, some see and believe, but blessed are you who have not seen and yet believe. That's how we address our doubts. When we look at what Jesus has done and what he's doing in our life. I'm going to ask you a question again. How many of you believe that in my hand is something that when you see it, you aren't going to see it again. <laughs> Some are still doubting. That's amazing. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, there's, there's another cashew nut right here. <laughs> More importantly, are you doubting God this morning for, in some way? If you are a normal gathering of human beings, I'm going to say there's some of you are. I may even be bold enough to say all of us are in some degree or another or will. Doubt God in some way. We're human beings. Christ died on the cross for us. And he rose again on Easter Sunday. So that all of our enemies are conquered. Satan's been conquered. The power of sin has been conquered. Death has been conquered. We do not find ourselves, do not need to find ourselves behind locked doors in fear. But Christ has given us that peace, which is beyond our understanding. And in those moments when you have doubts and you find yourself asking, does God know what's going on in my life? Is God even seeing me or near me? The 
Look to him, because he's there. He's got you by the hand. And you're walking with him throughout that ordeal. The illustration I oftentimes used is the picture of a father with a young child taking him by the hand, teaching him how to walk. At least none of my kids ever came up to me and said, Dad, can you teach me how to walk? As a parent, we take him by the hand to hold him up. And that's what God is doing this morning for each and every one of us. He's got you by the hand. And he's going to take you and walk you through whatever these circumstances. And through our doubts or whatever it is, he's saying, peace be with you. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your love in our life and that it's unconditional. We thank you for your patience in our life and that it's you who enters our life. We have those doubts. I know for myself, uh, afterwards, I feel ashamed of doubting. But I also know it's a time when I can grow and putting my life into your hands, trusting you. I pray for everybody that's here and all of our families and all of our family members that in those moments of doubt, we look to you. We look to you. And we thank you for not thinking less of us when we do doubt but thinking of us even more. And then you give us what we need. We pray this confidently in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. There was one other phrase I wanted to say, and I forgot to say it. Is we don't take a leap of faith when we do this. We take a leap to faith. Because God's given that to us in our life. So live your life to the fullest in the confidence and trust. So as we go out, the Lord will bless you and keep you. We'll make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. We'll look upon you with his favor and give you his peace and his words to each of us, the words from Jesus. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. Let's stand and sing our song. Every battle, through every heartbreak, through every circumstance, and I believe that you are my fortress. Oh, you are my portion, you are my hiding place, and I believe that you are the way.
with mercies that are new and know my fears and doubts they can all come true because they can't stay long when I'm here with you and it's a new horizon and I'm set on you and you need me here today mercies that are new and all my fears and doubts they can all come true because they can't stay long when I believe you are the way and the truth and the life oh I believe you are the way and the truth and the life and I believe it's a new horizon it's a new horizon and I'm set on Mercies that are new, all my fears and doubts, making all come to because they can't stay long. And I believe you are. 